Welcome back. Um, if you remember from last, uh, the last video, we were discussing the geography of Southeast Asia. Now this video is a continuation from the previous video, and we will be discussing the economic geography, social geography, and geopolitics of Southeast Asia. The economies of Southeast Asia have been booming recently due to a growing working age population. Now, the growing number of workers and consumers in Southeast Asia have led to sustained growth in agricultural production, industrial production, and a booming service economy. Now, the massive growth in economic output in Southeast Asia has been spurred in part by foreign direct investment into the Association of Southeast Asian Nations member states. Now, Singapore was the largest recipient of FDI in 2017 with Indonesia and Vietnam coming in second and third. As you can see from this table right here, Indonesia, Malaysia, Philippines, Thailand, Vietnam, and Singapore have sustained real GDP growth. Uh, again, this has been partially precipitated by this flow in uh, FDI as of 2016-2017. So uh, the agricultural sector is still a main portion of employment in Southeast Asia today. Uh, wet rice production is largely uh, responsible for the success of the agricultural sector as it is one of the main exports in Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar, Thailand, and Vietnam. Now, as you can see by this graph, Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar, and Vietnam are highly dependent on agriculture for employment. 55% uh, roughly of Cambodia's uh, economy, 72% of Laos's economy, uh, and 49% of Myanmar's economy is dedicated to agricultural production. So why is agriculture so important to Southeast Asia? Now, there are several answers to this question, uh, but if it weren't for the Green Revolution, wet rice production would probably not have been as large as it is today. If we go to this slide, uh, it gives us sort of a short overview of what the Green Revolution represents. So what is the Green Revolution? The Green Revolution, also called the Third Agricultural Revolution, started in the late 1950s, 1960s, post-World War II, with the development of a series of research technology initiatives. Uh, these initiatives resulted in the adoption of new technologies such as chemical fertilizers, controlled irrigation, and uh, mechanized farming. Now the Ford Foundation and the Rockefeller Foundation were heavily involved in this initial development in Mexico. Uh, now the leader of the Green Revolution uh, was Norman Borlaug, who actually received the Nobel Peace Prize in 1970. Um, he is credited with saving over a billion people from starvation. So what does this have to do with Southeast Asia? The technology created during the Green Revolution made its way to the rice fields in the Philippines by 1960 and by, mid, by the mid-60s would eventually make its way to Malaysia. So between 1961 and 1993, rice yields doubled in Asia and Malaysia benefited greatly from this technology. Um, as this slide says here, the Green Revolution led to the quadrupling of rice yields in Malaysia and doubling in the Philippines. It also led to an increased use of pesticides and fertilizers, making it an unsustainable practice due to its impact on biodiversity. Protests would eventually ensue in favor of organic farming. So, uh, while the rice yields increased due to the creation of this high yield rice seed shown in the middle of this picture right here, uh, the use of pesticides and artificial fertilizers really led to the reduction in biodiversity and many small farmers began to protest this and here recently there's been a move to go to a more um, organic style of farming, moving back to small farms. Um, some people have called it uh, fair trade practices. <clears throat> now one of the biggest critics of technology that's currently used in modern agriculture is Carl Sauer, 
who was the founder of cultural landscape theory and a professor at UC Berkeley. In 1988, he actually said, quote, a good aggressive bunch of American agronomists and plant breeders could ruin the native resources for good and all by pushing their American commercial stocks. So of course, uh, American agribusiness was behind the evolution of this new farming technology, and they were really the main ones who benefited and profited from this venture. So manufacturing is another booming sector in the Asian economy, uh, uh, the Southeast Asian economy. The rise of special economic zones toward the end of colonialism in Southeast Asia may have had an impact on this industrial growth. So if we go here to this slide right here, uh, as this graphic shows uh, the leading manufacturers and emerging manufacturers in Southeast Asia today, uh, today Singapore is one of the wealthiest countries in the world uh, and it is also uh, the wealthiest country in Southeast Asia. It produces consumer electronics, and machinery, uh, both Malaysia and Singapore have benefited, uh, have the benefit of geographic location. <clears throat> Kuala Lumpur and Singapore uh, are located next to some key shipping routes uh, that connect China with Africa and the New Silk Road initiative has really increased production in these countries. So let's go here to this shipping visualization. This is fairly accurate. Uh, it's supposed to show live ship, uh, shipments and as we can see if we zoom in here to this Strait of Malacca notice here this clumping of ships located around um, Singapore and then you also see another uh, few ships clumping next to Kuala Lumpur. And again we go back to Google Maps here is Kuala Lumpur. Even though it's not located directly along the coast it does benefit from shipping that comes in on the river systems. And so this is, location really plays a key aspect in industrialization. <clears throat> One of the fastest growing industrializing countries in Southeast Asia is of course Indonesia. And Indonesia has also taken advantage of their location as well. Of course, uh, Vietnam and Indonesia um, and the Philippines are considered newly industrialized countries and have a booming agricultural and electronic and uh, apparel industry. So recent data from the International Monetary Fund shows that uh, Southeast Asia is catching up to China's industrial economy. Now, this is primarily due to the movement of transnational corporations out of China to countries like Malaysia and Indonesia. Uh, this may also be due to increasing wages in China. As wages increase, many of these corporations move to other countries to find cheap labor. So you can see here this graph shows a uh, ASEAN countries or the Association of Southeast Asian Nations uh, as they are catching up slowly but surely by 2018 with industrial growth and production in China. Now with the creation of special economic zones across Southeast Asia, many of these corporations have moved to Vietnam, Thailand, Indonesia, and Myanmar. As this, these maps really show, several key special economic zones are located in coastal urban areas uh, for easy shipping access. As you can see here in Indonesia, the 12 main special economic zones are all located along the coast. Uh, Thailand has uh, several, but uh, most of theirs are located along river systems. Of course, all three of Vietnam's special economic zones are located along the coast. And then, of course, we have here uh, zones in Myanmar, all located along the coast, attempting to take advantage of location. Uh, because of reduced regulations, limited government oversight, and cheap labor in these zones, these cities have grown in population as well. Uh, Indonesia, Indonesia has uh, greatly benefited from this industrial growth and large multinational corporations have moved in to major coastal hubs to take advantage of this inexpensive labor and a rather young consumer market in Indonesia. 
So the next point on the slide here refers to the rise of financial centers and global cities in Southeast Asia. Uh, leading centers like Manila, Kuala Lumpur, Singapore, and Bangkok have become hubs for finance and banking. So this slide shows three major financial hubs in Southeast Asia, Bangkok, Kuala Lumpur, and Singapore. Um, and while they may not be considered global cities by most geographers, uh, these Southeast Asian, at least in the Southeast Asian realm, these are their version of global cities. So what is a global city? A global city is a major urban area that is home to major stock exchanges. Uh, they are influential in international political affairs, uh, service as major media hubs, have large mass transit networks, are home to a large international airport, and have a prominent skyline. And as you can see here, uh, 2016 top 10 global destination cities by number of international overnight visitors. Bangkok at the top of the list. Uh, this is overnight international visitors. Um, and then down the list a little bit, Singapore. And then finally, finally Kuala Lumpur. So these are major center hubs. And if you look here closely, here is of course Singapore. We have Kuala Lumpur and Malaysia. And then we have Bangkok, located on coastal Thailand, large metropolitan areas. So the rise of tourism and the rise of these global cities in Southeast Asia have led to uh, an, an, a growing informal economy. And like we've talked about this before, an informal economy refers to economic activities that are not regulated by the state. Um, and the informal markets in Southeast Asia make up a large percentage of jobs. Because of the nature of the informal economy, it is hard to determine the exact number of people that work in the informal economy. And for this reason, this data is estimated and often very inaccurate. So you have to take it with a grain of salt. Uh, for example, the International Labor Board, uh, Labor Organization estimates that roughly 50 percent of the Philippine population works in the informal sector. And the reality is, it's probably much higher. So let's go to this slide right here. Uh, this chart shows international labor and organization estimates for informal jobs in selected Asian countries. As much as 85 percent of Laotian people work in the informal sector, by far the largest percentage out of any of these other Asian economies. Um, and around 70% of Burmese, or uh, people from Myanmar, Burmese people, uh, and 68% uh, of Indonesians work in this sector as well. And they take advantage of the growing service sector because uh, tourists come in to these, these major urban hubs and they often are flush with cash. And so these, uh, these individuals don't have to pay taxes. And they can take advantage of, of really a lack of Tourists' lack of understanding of the domestic economy. Anyways, so another major factor in recent economic growth in Southeast Asia it was the creation of the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, also called ASEAN. Uh, formed in 1961, ASEAN is a regional supranational organization of 10 countries in Southeast Asia. Its purpose is to promote economic intergovernmental cooperation, um, integrate educational, military, sociocultural systems of these member states. Today, all 10 Southeast Asian countries are members of ASEAN, which has helped increase economic development and integration amongst these member states in recent years. Now, in 1997, ASEAN met with China, South Korea, and Japanese officials at a summit in Malaysia to form ASEAN plus three, which would lead the development of lead to the development of trade relations between these newly added countries in ASEAN. Uh, but it, it it started expanding so that by 2012, ASEAN plus three nations met in Cambodia, right there, and added New Zealand, India, and Australia 
uh, to the ASIN plus six agreement. Now this agreement was the next attempt at further trade, free trade agreements between uh, East Asian states. And the new Silk Road, as discussed before, has also had a major impact on this trade relationship. So another important variable in development of Southeast Asia is population growth, which has really played a major role in economic development in this region. Now this population pyramid to the right of this slide represents male and female age groups of ASEAN countries in 2018. Notice the slight bulge in the middle and the fairly even distribution between, just a, between ages 0 to 4 uh, to ages 25 and 29. This represents a growing working age population, which is one of the reasons recent, uh, for recent industrialization in Southeast Asia. Now, if you look at the line graph on the bottom right-hand side uh, of the slide, you'll notice that most ASEAN uh, countries have steady population growth between 2008 and 2018. Of course, Indonesia, located here at the top of the graph, has twice as many people as the next most populated country, the Philippines. And it has the fastest growth rate in Southeast Asia. Indonesia also has the fourth largest population in the world, yet another reason why it has been industrializing at such a rapid rate. So if you look back at this population pyramid, where does ASEAN fall on the demographic transition model? So if you can remember back to chapter one, uh, we covered the demographic transition model. Uh, the DTM is a theory that attempts to explain historical shifts from high birth rates and high death rates in societies with minimal technology, education, and economic development to low birth rates and low death rates in societies with advanced technology, education, and economic development. According to the DTM, societies transition between stage uh, between five stages as they become more industrialized. Now, stage one uh, is marked by high birth rates and high death rates and no population growth. Um, in stage two, death rates decline due to a surplus in food, um, and, uh, but birth rates generally remain relatively high for at least another generation. Because of this, total population uh, does continue to grow. Now in stage three, usually a generation later, birth rates begin to decline but remain, but remain higher than death rates. So populations continues uh, to grow. Now this usually coincides with industrialization. Uh, in stage four, society has become more industrialized in the development of birth control, high technology, um, increase in education, and a movement towards female equality results in low birth rates and death rates, really causing a plateau effect on population growth. Now, some scholars disagree about stage five. Um, some say that birth rates decline below death rates and population shrinks, while others claim that birth rates rise again and death rates remain low. So there is some disagreement as to whether or not this is true or if stage five even exists at all. Um, so where does Southeast Asia fall within this model? Now, judging from the population pyramid on the last slide and based on recent industrialization, Southeast Asia would likely be in stage three. Now, of course, that doesn't go for all the countries in Southeast Asia. There's gonna obviously be some, uh, some major differences across space, but for right now, uh, we can conclude that Southeast Asia as, as a region would generally fall in stage three. And this really has helped them in the long run it, to develop an industrial sphere. All right, let's take a look at recent demographic map of Southeast Asia from 2015. Now this map shows a natural rate of increase, shows the natural rate of increase in population and total fertility rates in Southeast Asia. Um, of course, East Timor, Laos, Philippines, and Cambodia are at the top of the list. Notice that each one of these countries have a fertility rate over 2.1, which is the replacement rate 
of population growth. Now the fertility rate is the average number of children that, have, that would be born to a woman over her lifetime. Uh, replacement rate is the total fertility rate at which women give birth to enough babies to sustain the population levels. What this means is that if we assume no in-migration or out-migration, any of these countries with a fertility rate above 2.1 is expected to see population growth rate, uh, population growth into the next generation. So where are all these people living? While much of Southeast Asia has remained rural, there is a growing percentage of population moving to cities. Now this has led to a rise of urban primacy and the development of primate cities. Now urban primacy uh, refers to the tendency of one city to dominate the economy. Some examples in uh, Southeast Asia are Manila, Jakarta, and Bangkok. Uh, primate cities refer to a particular city that dominates culture, economic development, and politics in a country. Again, Manila, Jakarta, and Bangkok are all examples of this phenomenon. We can go here to Jakarta. Jakarta is by far the largest city in, in all of Indonesia. But what makes it a primate city is not just the population, but also its political economic clout throughout Indonesia as well. Now because of the rapid urbanization trend in Southeast Asia, population density has also increased in major urban areas along coastlines and river systems. As you can see here in this map, now this is an older map. Uh, I think it's recent as of 2010, but you get the idea. Uh, a large portion of the population living near these major urban centers. Metropolitan areas such as Hanoi, Ho Chi Minh, uh, also called Saigon, Jakarta, uh, of course Manila, uh, Yangon and Bangkok have all seen massive population growth uh, growth in recent years. Now let's take a look at this link in the bottom right hand corner titled Urbanization, uh, Urbanization Data Link. I think I've already got it pulled up over here. Yes, I do. Alright, so this table shows the increasing urbanization trend in ASEAN countries since 2018. Notice that every ASEAN country has seen an increase in percentage urban population over this decade period. As I scroll over here, you can see Myanmar, uh, Philippines, Singapore, Thailand. Um, Singapore is the only one, of course, that hasn't seen an increase in urbanization because it was already one city. Um, as we can see back here at Google Maps, Singapore, the entire population of Singapore lives in a city, hence its, its status as a city-state. So the Green Revolution and mechanized farming had a major role in this trend in the 1960s, but today industrialization and the promise of high paying manufacturing jobs, I put that in air quotes, high paying, they're not high paying, um, has attracted workers into these densely packed cities after big agribusiness uh, moved into countries like Indonesia, Philippines, Malaysia, and Thailand. Many of these small farms were were bought up and people were forced to move into urban centers. Now their children are the workforce that manufactures much of our consumer products in the United States. Now this rapid growth in urbanization has also led to traffic problems in cities like Jakarta. So let's uh, take a look at uh, a newscast by Al Jazeera on how Jakarta is trying to fix this problem. Let's expand this so we can get a better view of it. Another government's attempt to reduce Jakarta's famous traffic jams. Every weekday from 6 to 9 a.m., an odd and even license plate system will take effect here on the toll road. It's a system that has been used already in the city as well and has now been extended to the suburbs. It's easy to remember because on the odd days, an odd number plate is allowed to enter here the toll road and on the even days, only even numbers. And if someone tries to enter the toll road with the wrong number, there will be no mercy and he will immediately be sent back. For those who are not allowed to enter the toll road, the government has so 
bus every day already, so I'm not getting tired being stuck in traffic. In the bus, I can sleep and wake up when I arrive. The government aims to reduce traffic here by 25% from around 8,000 cars a day to around 6,000. And it also wants to increase the speed that cars can drive here from around 25 kilometers an hour to 45. But now we're already hitting 70 kilometers an hour, so we're doing pretty well. But a lot of people fear that the traffic jams just move elsewhere. And this is the situation closer to the city. A recent study has found that people in Jakarta spend an average of 22 days a year just simply being stuck in traffic. This not only causes major air pollution, but also costs the economy around 5 billion US dollars a year. So, some, what many people, some people might call draconian measures to reduce popula uh, uh, excuse me, to reduce traffic problems in Jakarta. And if you've seen pictures of, I guess we can look that up, uh, Jakarta traffic. Some of these pictures are pretty horrifying. And so these moves that they're making m are considered by many to be necessary. Now other industrial cities, industrially, uh, industrializing cities uh, in Southeast Asia have not only done stuff like this, uh, but they've also uh, actually taken out lanes from the road so it makes it more difficult to drive on and they've removed parking in the downtown areas, business districts, so people stop driving their cars. One particular example is um, uh, Bogota, Colombia, although it's not Southeast Asia. Bogota, Colombia recently uh, created separate bus lanes and they took two lane roads and knocked them down to one lane roads and they removed all parking in downtown. Um, and then they also offer subsidies for people with lower income to take buses, etc. So some of these moves may, uh, may seem to be necessary, but many people have also argued that it is a bit draconian. So why does Southeast Asia have so many primate cities? It's an interesting question. Because of the influx of foreign direct investment and transnational corporations, all part of neocolonialism, countries like Indonesia have seen massive development in one city over the rest. Jakarta is by definition a primate city, and many scholars have argued that this is the result of colonialism. So according to Brian Berry, listed right here, Quote, under, the, under, control, under colonial rule, most empires were controlled by holding key cities and strategic points, head links that connected the colonial net. For colonial powers to extend and consolidate their authority in alien social geographical territories, cities were the necessary base of action. British rule in India, for example, centered on capital and provincial cities, both for maintaining an integrated uh, an integrated and authoritarian administrative structure and for securing the economic base of its power. The collection of taxes and control over the export of raw materials and the import of British manufactured goods. Elsewhere in Southeast Asia, the structure of colonial economy did not permit these cities to gener be uh, generative of economic growth. The colonial cities were subordinate to the metropolis and would trade acting as foci for the alien middlemen and effectively inhibiting economic growth. So Warren Robinson, uh, in the remainder of this article, argues that this has resulted in the consolidation of economic, cultural, and political power in these former colonial capitals. This is one of the reasons why cities like Jakarta in Indonesia hold supremacy over other Indonesian cities. As you can see here, uh, compared to the next largest city, Jakarta out beats that city out by more than double. Now, geopolitical relationships are also a major factor in recent developments in Southeast Asia. While we don't have really enough time to go in depth on this subject, we can look at two important points. Now, regional populism is a major political force in many of these former European colonies. 
Uh, in general, populist politicians in Southeast Asia argue that the poor are being exploited by the elite and they are the only people or persons that can return power back to the people. So a great example of populism in Southeast Asia is the rise of the infamous Rodrigo Duterte. In March of 2016, Duterte was elected by the president of the Philippines. He, uh, he was considered to be an outsider because he was the mayor of Davao uh, in southern Mindanao territory. You can see that here. So this is the Philippines, and the Philippines is rather large, and I think we overlook um, just how big this territory is. So let's see this Philippine map compared to U.S. And there you go. The Philippines is a rather massive territory, but it just doesn't look very large uh, from the perspective of somebody from the United States. But it is a very large territory, and Mindanao is would be the equivalent of the distance between uh, Detroit and being in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean off the coast of, of North Carolina. So it's a long distance. So he was considered to be an outsider as he was from this Mindanao territory. Now he ran on a law and order ticket and promised to get rid of the drug problem in the Philippines. Now the Philippines uh, have a centralized unitary style government based out of Manila and Duterte also campaigned on uh, de the decentralization and a shift to a federal style government where power would be shared between Manila and the territories. Now he promised to return power back to the people. Now one of the reasons for this campaign promise was the growing spatial inequality between the national capital region and other regions around this country. Now the, this graph here shows um, dom gross domestic product per capita from 2015 to, and 2017 between regions and the capital region um, and it shows that it has uh, that this difference between the capital region and the remaining region is double the next uh, wealthiest region uh, located here. Uh, Duterte promised to federalize the, Philipp the Philippines uh, so that each one of these territories could essentially control its own economic output. Let's see if we can find a better representation of this. Um, GDP per capita, Philippines map. Okay, this is not the same not quite the same, but it gives us an idea. Um, over 150,000 Philippine, uh, Philippines per capita gross domestic product by region in the pesos. And you notice here that the wealthiest region is around Minden, uh, Manila. And of course, as you get further and further away from Manila, uh, it becomes poorer and poorer. Now, one of the reasons for uh, Duterte's campaign promise was really the growing spatial inequality between the national capital region and other regions around the country. Um, and he would become famous uh, for his, his ability to stand up against those in charge. It was the hopes of the, the people that voted him in that he would actually come in and do something, returning power back to the people. And hopefully that would in turn translate into some uh, economic development in these sort of uh, pro uh, these periphery locations. And being that he was from the Southern Island uh, made things that much better. Now he also became, and this is probably one of the most interesting parts of Duterte, he became infamous for being tough on crime um, after his election when he ordered police to shoot on sight 
if they witnessed drug pushers. He also made headlines with some of his comments, and I put some of those up here. He says, uh, made a comment uh, in May of 2016 after Pope Francis visited Manila causing traffic jams. He says, I, want, I wanted to call him Pope, son of a whore, go home, do not visit us again. Um, he made similar comments about Barack Obama in uh, 2000, late 2015, 2016. He said, I called him a son of a whore, I will curse you in this forum. And then this is another one. Uh, if you are corrupt, I will fetch you using a helicopter to, to Manila and I will throw you out. I have done this before. Why would I not do this again? And of course, this is uh, him threatening corrupt officials out of Manila. And so this is, again, the outsider coming in to, to, to change things and return the power back to the people. Now, while Duterte is a famous example um, of a populist leader in Southeast Asia, he's not the only one. He's just one of the loudest ones. I found this interesting. Their, uh, voters were surveyed in 2017, and when they were asked why they voted uh, for Duterte, uh, many of them answered because he punishes the guilty, um, he punishes drug dealers. He, they love his style of management. Um, he, cuts, uh, he cut crime as the mayor of Davao. Uh, and another prominent one, he's an outsider and he's not controlled by foreign corporate interests. Now whether that's true or not, I can't argue. But it's, uh, it is really something that represents the rise of a populist leader especially in Southeast Asia. All right, uh, another major political, geopolitical topic in Southeast Asia is the recent Rohingya ethnic cleansing in Myanmar. Uh, the Rohingya persecution occurred in late 2015, actually continues on to today, uh, but in 2015 when Ma Myanmar's armed forces and police started a major crackdown on Rohingya people in the Rakhine state in the country's northwestern region. Now, to escape this violence and persecution, thousands of Rohingyas migrated from Myanmar uh, into Bangladesh. Now, the international media called these people the boat people. And you can see here the proximity. Um, here is Myanmar. And here is Bangladesh. You can also see that here on this map as well. Now to escape violence and persecution, thousands of uh, these thousands of migrants did successfully reach the Bangladeshi border. Uh, but by 2016, um, insurgents, which many uh, which may have been Rohingya or not, there's not a lot of evidence to the contrary. But uh, the Myanmar government claimed that they were Rohingyas. Uh, they attacked three Burmese border posts along the Bangladeshi border. Now in response, Myanmar uh, military forces and extremists and extremist Buddhists uh, started a major crackdown on the Rohingya Muslims in the country's western region uh, in response to the attacks on border police camps by these unidentified insurgents. Uh, so by 2017, Myanmar security forces killed thousands of Rohingya people, forcing thousands more to migrate to neighboring Bangladeshi villages. Reports from various international organizations uh, have said that the military operations were indiscriminate attacks on the Rohingya population, calling it, quote, ethnic cleansing. Now, as of 2018, as many as 2,100, uh, excuse me, 280 villages were burned down and destroyed. Uh, several refugee sites were built in Bangladesh along the border. Um, as you can see from the map in the upper right hand corner um, of this slide, you can see the development of several of these refugee sites and the corresponding populations of those people located there. I'll give you a better view of this. So uh, as you can see from this satellite, 
from this uh, satellite photo in the bottom and the aerial photograph in the bottom right, some of these villages were utterly destroyed. According to the BBC, hundreds of thousands of Rohingya people have migrated to Saudi Arabia, uh, Pakistan, India, and Bangladesh, and of course Indonesia. Some have uh, even migrated, this is interesting, migrated to the coast of Myanmar and recently have declared themselves uh, independent, um, although uh, nobody is accepting this independence as of right now. Well, it's an unfortunate story and I wish we had more time, uh, but I think that's going to have to be it today. So uh, I will see you next time and uh, thanks for watching.